in uh, this uh, session, I will talk about an often neglected part of a tracker project, and that's uh, monitoring and evaluation. Um, what we want is to make sure that projects are running smoothly and that we learn from our mistakes. And it's really not rocket science, but you need to be, it requires some conscious effort and you need to plan for it. Uh, in the session, I hope that uh, you will learn more on why monitoring evaluation of a tracker program is important. Uh, some selected uh, items that you can monitor for your tracker pro program. Uh, we'll also have a presentation of some practical tools that you can use for monitoring at a more technical level in DHIS2 and my colleague Brian, he will, uh, he will show you some slides on that. And then I will also go through some different types of evaluations that you can use to learn from your project. Can you mute Ellis? I think I'm hearing your background. Yeah, so monitoring and evaluation, um, it can provide information on what an intervention is doing, how well it's performing, whether it's achieving its uh, aims and objectives. And it can also guide future interventions and activities. Uh, and it's really an important part of accountability to funding agencies and to the other stakeholders in the project. Uh, and plans for monitoring and evaluation, it should be done at the beginning of the project, beginning of the intervention, so you know what you want to monitor or evaluate. But very often we're pretty bad at this in our field. And, and, and why is this sort of the neglected or considered the stepchild of project planning? Maybe it can feel like it's not 100% necessary. It's not sort of the, it's not the burning activity to be done. It's more important to get things up and running and to require funding, etc. So it can feel pretty abstract, perhaps. Might not be high on the agenda of stakeholders. And I think it's important, and I want you to take this away from this session, that monitoring and evaluation can be done very extensively, very structured, very well planned, according to rigid protocols. Uh, you can have big teams working on monitoring and evaluation. But the monitoring and evaluation that is good is the monitoring and evaluation that you actually do. So uh, it doesn't have to be that extensive. It doesn't have to be a huge, big, complex thing. It's just more important that you as a project manager or project owner consciously sort of pay attention to how your project is running and what you can learn from it or what you can learn from your own mistakes or other mistakes or the, the factors surrounding your project that you can do something about or that you can adapt to. So it's better to pick a few key things that you would like to pay attention to in your project and actually monitor them than to just close your eyes and think that things are going pretty well and dandy, but you don't really know because it's a bit uncomfortable and it's a bit of a struggle to find out, etc. So a little is a lot better than nothing. So there is a difference between monitoring and evaluation. So monitoring is sort of regular collection of information about all project activities. This is your day-to-day uh, gathering our information or week to week or month to month, something you do at regular intervals to keep track of uh, how your project is progressing, to identify problems quickly. For example, I will assume that uh, it is important that all um, nurses who are um, uh, using your tuberculosis uh, tracker program, that they have a functioning device. But if you just close your eyes and you don't actually check whether they have a functioning device, you have no idea and you have no way to actually um, uh, help them to fix that problem. So you need to be, you need to decide what you want to keep look out for and decide how you're going to do it. And this is something that is being done at a regular, regular intervals. And it's, it's there to sort of uh, inform your day-to-day -day decisions. What should we do today? What should we do tomorrow? Um, what do we need to change straight away? What problems do we need to fix uh, along, the, um, along the course of the project to make sure that things are running smoothly? And it serves as input to evaluation. So once you through monitoring have discovered um, uh, a systematic set of problems, for example, you can then evaluate why did we end up here or 
what are the factors contributing to this and what do we do about that going forward? So evaluation, it has more sort of a judgment or value perspective to it. You want to say uh, why and you want to say, is this good? Is it bad? Uh, how should it have been done? Um, instead of just sort of recording and accounting, here you assess. And an evaluation is, is more used to do major decisions, not just these day to day, but like, where do we want to be next year, in two years time? What key areas do we need to acquire funding for? Uh, and, and it provides information for doing planning and something that you do more periodically, not every day, every month, but maybe you do it at the start of your program, midway and Again, please just post questions or raise your hand if you have any questions. I think what is uh, important is to clearly define in the beginning what you want to monitor at the start of your project. So, and it should be closely linked to the goals of your tracker program. I think we've been talking a lot about this in this um, academy, but you need to be clear on, on why you are doing a tracker program uh why do you even want to start this project what do you want to achieve and then you need to figure out what to monitor and it needs to link back up to that goal so go back to the first tab in your project planning template look look at what you wrote there and then you would need to sort of link your monitoring activities to to that goal and you need to think through what success looks like in your project what would make your uh, project owners happy? What would make you happy? When would the stakeholders in this project sort of pat them on, themselves on the back and say, okay, we, we did good with this project. We achieved what we want to achieve. It can be different things. It could be less children missing vaccine appointments. It could be more happy nurses. It could be that all health facilities in a region is using the system at, a, at certain intervals. It could be that the system is always up. Um, that there's no gap in the data. This will vary a lot from project to project, but you need to be have a conscious um, uh, thought around what the success looks like in your project. And once you've done that, you can pick some key indicators that are important to your project. So if you're uh, if you're concerned about the um, the the less uh, the, the of the children missing vaccines, you can say that. We consider our projects um, successful if uh, less than 5% of uh, the vaccinated children are missing their vaccine appointments, for example. And that's what you would like to monitor. How many children are showing up? How many children are getting their vaccines? What did those numbers look like last month? What is it now? What is it on a, on a whole year? And you can also change what you monitor as the project progresses. So it's not like you decide on something uh, at the start and then you're stuck with that. But maybe you figure out as the project progresses that you would like to pay attention to other things. Alma, can I make a statement? Yes. I think this is a um, good consideration with tracker programs because with tracker programs, you really are kind of looking at data and looking at work from a different perspective. So this is a great opportunity to really kind of redefine traditionally what you're monitoring. So um, for like an EPI program, you want to, of course, find the dropout rate of the children. Um, however, there's this opportunity to kind of trim down all the fluff and reevaluate what you really want to monitor. And I think someone made a good comment earlier about um, I think that they made a comment about how it's important to do quality over quantity. Mm. Um, this is why it's the stepchild because I mean, you have so much work to do. So mm. really focus on like really take some time with the groups to decide what uh, you really want to monitor. Yeah, and I think many of the things that you could monitor, you will sort of figure out if you have a key indicator or a couple of key indicators that you do monitor all the time. And you see that we never get data in on time. So, and I'll get to that later, but you should always do some investigations if the numbers or if the results from your monitoring isn't what you expect, you need to do some investigation. And then maybe that will, that again will highlight that 
well, the numbers aren't coming in because the nurses are lacking devices or because because then you make that phone call and you say to the to your district managers and say listen we have this huge problem we never get any numbers from this region why is that oh it's because of blah 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 or they feel that the system is always lagging okay maybe that's a really an indication that you for a period of time you should pay close attention to your server performance for example so you don't have to monitor a hundred different things at all times but adjust as you go. And if you identify problem problematic areas in your in your program, then of course you monitor that more closely for a period on a period of time until you've fixed fix that problem. Thanks for the good comments, Mike. Okay. Any other comments? Nope. <clears throat> okay. I wanna, is Brian on? Are you on Brian? Can someone ping Brian to make sure he's ready for his slides later? If he doesn't answer now. Yeah. Uh, Brian is here and now has co-host. If you wanna unmute yourself, Brian. Yeah, I sorry, I wasn't, uh, I couldn't. Okay. Myself. <laughs> no, I wanted to, I'm not sure if you're ready to answer this, Brian, but uh, I mean, you've been part of a pretty complex tracker program in Palestine, yeah. for example. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any reflections around what sort of things you monitored in your, in your tracker program with where you were following mothers and children? Quite detailed. Yeah, I mean, there is, um, there's different ways from approaching that as I'll be going into in a second uh, the slides, but um, mm -hmm. definitely monitoring of, uh, of data quality to make sure that um, you know that some important uh, data points within the tracker program are, are actually being entered. Um, so, for example, that might be uh, like a pregnancy identification stage that we had, making sure that the very early um, entrance into the program that the key questions are being answered before we get into more clinical workflow. Mm -hmm. um, and also making sure that um, you know usage is pretty consistent ac across different users and organization units, so that you're getting uh, for something like pregnancies, it's not um, it's not as seasonal as something like malaria, right? So, but you might still have um, you might still expect to see consistent numbers coming in from all clinics instead of having um, you know rapid spikes. Um, and then another thing that we looked into was. Um, uh, and since it was a point of care tool, we wanted to assess um, how frequently people are actually creating uh, are creating events and enrollments at the point of care, as in during work hours, uh, when they would actually be seeing clients. And so developing a, a monitoring system to check when certain data points were actually being entered into the system by looking at like the, um, the tracked entity value audit logs and being able to assess, oh, actually like, 15% of all the data points that are being entered in this tracker are happening after the clinic, the clinics close for the day at around like four to six o'clock. So that implies that, you know, maybe we should be um, encouraging more point of care use, or we need to be talking to the clinicians about what are some of the, the reasons or obstacles why you can't um, enter in all of this data when the, the client is visiting the clinic. So those were some some things that we looked into. Yeah, that's great. And I think you also had a good <clears throat> a good example that I've heard previously. For example, seeing that you're now collecting individualized data, you can also drill deeper. So uh, what I've heard, for example, in the case of this Palestine project, is um, you wanted to monitor whether the women were getting um, a certain measurement, I think it was hemoglobin or something that they should receive once or twice during their antenatal care, they should get a certain blood test done. <clears throat> and you want to monitor whether the, the women are getting this, uh, this uh, test and if it's uh, routinely proving, etc. And then you see that uh, before you would just know that, okay, you have 100% coverage for, for this test in the population because you have uh, 10 pregnant women and you have 10 tests conducted and you sh everybody should be happy. But if you drill down a bit more in the data, you would perhaps see that uh, you've conducted the, this test five times on woman A and five times on, on woman B. And then you have uh, eight women that have never gotten this test, which is not the purpose of the program. So 
I think there are many yeah. interesting things that you can monitor and that tracker really allows you to monitor in terms of your service provision. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I, when it comes to the actual data outputs that we get, not just for the, the implementation of the project, but for um, monitoring of the, the services, um, there are so many different ways that you can actually um, use the, the tracker module modules to assess uh, quality of care indicators um, and or effective coverness uh, ratios so you can actually see um, are the timeliness of ANC visits at the right gestational age intervals actually occurring um, for individuals and then also like are they linking at those uh, different antenatal care visits to labs results in a timely manner so they can actually get um, uh, treatment if they need it at the right time um, rather than just waiting until the very end of the pregnancy and then adding up all of those numbers. So I think um, you, can, you can really look at this two ways because you can think that, okay, you need to actually monitor your tracker project per se, the, the IT and implementation project. You need to monitor certain indicators on whether sort of <clears throat> introducing the system is working as you would like. Um, but you can also use tracker data to monitor your health program. And that's, I guess that's the main benefit of tracker, right? Because you, you now get data that you can use to pay closer attention to how you actually provide the service itself. So that's two different, two different things to monitor. Thanks, Brian. Any questions from the chats or comments? Nope, just keep them coming if you have any. Um, after this slide, I'll do like a little Menti again. So on the side here, you can go in and, and add, the, go into Menti and add the, the code at the bottom. But you, we, we have some examples here of things to monitor and it's by no means exhaustive. This is just um, a little list that I made uh, when I was making the slides. Uh, you can monitor a whole lot of other things uh, and we'll cover that in the Menti afterwards. But here are some few things that you can monitor. You can monitor um users of the system how many users the percentage of users um like usage analytics brian will cover this a bit uh, later on how you could practically do that you could somehow measure user satisfaction how happy are you are the users who are using the system is it is it working for them <clears throat> You could look at the tracker program itself. You could look at the number or the proportion or somehow counting the, the tracked entities you have in your system, the mothers, the children, the stock, the cases, whatever, to see if it goes up or down or if you have a big proportion or a small proportion or coverage, et cetera. You could pay attention to the completeness of your tracker data. For example, we know that um, if you compare it to aggregate numbers, if you're collecting the same type of information, uh, if you're doing two different data collection activities, sometimes you could find that it differs. So example from doing COVID vaccinations now, we see that in certain countries, you might have recorded that you have administered uh, 300,000 COVID vaccine doses. But in Tracker, you've only registered 200,000 of them. So you could pay attention on whether your Tracker numbers are matching the aggregate numbers. Could be interesting. Mix, checking it with population figures or what you expect the, 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 the number of uh, tracked entities to be. <clears throat> you can pay attention to timeliness. So this could be, uh, is data coming in on time, like Brian mentioned here, uh, for um, AFI, adverse events following immunization. If you get a reaction after getting your vaccine, you could perhaps monitor how quickly do people register uh, the AFI after the vaccine is given or after the adverse event was reported, for example. How long did it take to file the official report? Um, how many reports were actually investigated or checked out? <clears throat> and other data quality indicators. Um, you can also do technical performance monitoring of your program. You can check um, monitor through various uh, different technical tools. I'm not the expert on this, but um, we have people that know how to do this, but you can check the, the uptime of your server, make sure it's not down, um, response times, uh, how long does the user have to wait before the page loads, et cetera, et cetera. Really important to pay attention to these things and monitor them regularly and, and really keep tabs on that. I mean, I've done 
evaluations and visited, we don't have to mention countries, but where you see that people are getting up at uh, four in the morning because that's when the server is most responsive and they'll climb to the top of a hill to enter their data. Um, or that data hasn't been entered for months because the, the, the server doesn't reply or it can't handle the load or it doesn't function well in the afternoons when people are actually doing the work, et cetera, et cetera. But if you don't pay attention to this, both looking at the technical performance of your program, but also going out there and checking with users, interviewing them, uh, visiting the field, hearing how is this working for you in practice, then you won't know. And it might be a huge problem for a long time. And, then your project is a bit of a waste. And you can support, you can do, you can monitor your support team, for example, saying that you have a call center that will support users. You could check the call center performance. How many phone calls are they able to pick up on time? How satisfied are people with their performance? This is just a very short list of a million things that you can monitor. And I think if we now move to the Menti, and when you are monitoring, whatever you choose to monitor in your project, it should be it should lead to a root cause analysis. So not just seeing the result, but then asking the question, why are we getting this result? What can you do about it? And then of course, implement the changes and continue monitoring it. It's pretty sort of an obvious message, but there's a lot of things that we like to monitor, but then again, same as the, same as the first mentee, what is being done with the result? Yeah, it's being put in the drawer, or it's put in a report or it's, it's put on a PowerPoint, but then, are you actually taking action based on the things that you do monitor? Then maybe it's better to monitor fewer things and focus on doing something about the results than monitoring 500 things and using all your project resources on that. And then no one has time to fix the issues. Now we are at the famous word of the day, capacity and competence. Capacity and Competence is the word of the day. I'll leave that up for 30 seconds. Capacity and competence. Okay, uh, next now we will, I'll give the word to Brian. He will talk about uh, more technical solutions you can use to do monitoring through DHIS2. I will give the floor to you. Just say next slide, uh, Brian, when I should uh, click your oh, slide. I was going to share slides, but that's fine. We can use this. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's just fine. Um, great. So um, we talked a, a bit, um, I think most importantly, to okay. understand um, the types of data that you want to collect for monitoring. Um, but um, often those data um, that you want to monitor for your tracker program to actually measure its uh, its coverage and the the rollout, um, maybe there that's not uh, what you can actually develop in DHIS2. So um, here are a list of uh, potential tools that you might want to uh, consider, and I've listed them in sort of increasing order of customization and complexity. Um, so to fit your own use case for monitoring uh, for monitoring tools. Um, so I think that the first one, which um, I'm sure everyone on this call is familiar with, is dashboards. Um, there are a lot of indicators that you could build about your tracker program in DHIS2 that you could then utilize as a, a type of um, admin level monitoring dashboard. So that might be just the number of, uh, of new enrollments or events for your tracker program, uh, the number of org units that have reported successfully on a given month, um, or it might be some data completeness indicators as well. So you, if you have a, a form where you know that you know, every, 10 every one of the 10 questions actually needs to be filled in, then you could build a, a percentage indicator to assess what is the average percentage of indicators that are actually being filled in um, for this event um, uh, in, in the tracker program. Um, and another thing that you might consider, of course, then is validation rule analysis. So um, with that same idea of building on program indicators and indicators for your, uh, for your program monitoring, um, at just at an administrative level, uh, you could also run some routine validation rule checks um, for to say, if you are rolling out this program incrementally, 
um, and you know that you should be adding on more users and uh, more tracker events every month, then maybe if one organization unit drops off and stops using the system, you could be alerted through validation rule analysis that um, this month, this clinic started um, using the system less than it did the previous month. And that might be some uh, nudge for you to get sent via um, an email or a DHIS2 report of um, a list of all of the clinics that are not using the system um, as average. Um, yeah, that's a, a good question um, from uh, Saad Digitus. Um, and we'll, we'll get to that in a, in a second. So there are also a variety of um, tools that are available in the DHIS2 App Hub, but these are not um, core DHIS2 apps. However, um, they have been developed for other purposes and are uh, public use. So you can um, look into the DHIS2 App Hub and explore two separate apps, which, I th which I'll go into just briefly here. Um, you can look at Usage Analytics, which is the app that I'm presenting here. And from this, you can get a list of the number of, of uh, favorite views and dashboard views. So you can see which dashboard is um, the most uh, frequently visited. I think, um, I think uh, yeah, or the number of dashboards uh, that have been viewed. Um, and then this, um, within this usage analytics, you can also see the number of active users in your system uh, month over month. Um, so there's a lot of interesting things that you can drill down with this usage analytics app. Um, it's exploiting this um, within DHIS2 every time that a, a favorite is opened from a dashboard, um, then you get like a, a data statistics event that's, uh, that's generated in, um, in the back end of the system. And so you can actually analyze that and see which users are most active on your dashboards and most active with your analytics apps. There's also the um, user extended app, which I'll go into just briefly. But um, for all of these other um, types of tools here, um, I'll go through just briefly, but um, at the most complex that you might consider um, are doing something custom, whether that's a, 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 an SQL view for certain tables in the backend that are not exposed to other DHIS2 apps, but with a SQL view can actually extract that information for, um, for routine monitoring. Uh, one example that um, may be useful is to consider the program temp ownership audit table. Um, we remembered earlier in our discussions about security and privacy, this notion of breaking the glass or accessing a record that's outside, that was um, initially enrolled outside of one's um, organization unit where they can actually capture data. Um, and when that happens, and you have to write in a short note about why you're accessing this, uh, this, this record. Um, if you go into the program temp ownership audit table, then you can find um, a list of all of those breaking the glass accesses. And then you can assess sort of um, how frequently that breaking the glass feature is being used uh, on your program. Um, some other things that um, you might consider for, free, for SQL views might just be getting the number of new events by user um, that have been entered, or as I, as I described to Anna earlier, looking at the time when events are being created as well, so that you can assess um, data use in hours or after uh, work hours. Um, there's also ways for, um, you can extract data from the DHIS2 API for similar types of information. Um, one way that we use those um, custom scripts were to generate um, reports on um, scheduled messages that have been delivered from the system, which messages were being the most frequently delivered uh, to, to, um, to, the, to the patients in e-registries. And then um, you could also, as I'll, I'll go into in a bit, um, even exploit this, um, uh, the, the platform of DHIS2 to develop your own app that might assist your, um, your program monitoring. And I'll discuss that just briefly. Next slide, Anna. There, uh, there is a question in the chat, uh, Brian. Can we check yeah. on the dashboard if someone is struggling with syncing or if someone is getting error messages? Um, yeah, so with, uh, with Android monitoring, that would be one of the upcoming slides. Um, I, I'm not sure if we can see that 
um, per user. Maybe um, Jaime could chime in, but um, we could also, uh, it, it is possible to see the, the error logs that you can get. Hmm. Um, let me check, yeah. Um, so this is the, an example of the user extended app. Um, oh, it's, it's um, slightly different from what I had earlier. But um, if in the user extended app here, um, you don't just see the information that you get from the user app, um, but it, this is a way to display all of the information about users that is exposed through the API. So now you cannot just see here the, um, the name and, and surname of a user, um, but also their, um, their roles and their groups. And then also the last login that a user had and the date that that was last updated. And then so if you want to filter and then export this data, you could actually make a, a, a table routinely of the number of um, active users and by group of users, um, which ones have um, not been logging in recently. So that might be something to look into. Uh, next slide. Okay, so this was, um, so this is a, an example of what you can get from um, the Google, uh, Google Play console. Um, so, and we use this on our programs as well for e-registries. We, um, we had a custom uh, DHIS2 Android app that was based on the uh, DHIS2 SDK. Um, and so we added a few more features into this. And what we could actually do with that when we had our own uh, fork of this Android app is that we created our own a um, Android uh, APK and then loaded it as its own listing into the Google Play Store. Um, and what that allowed us to do was to actually um, use the Google Play and Google Analytics features to assess things like crash reports um, for certain endpoints of our um, of our app. So you can see that we had like a very serious problem with this um, a number format exception. I think it was like um, uh, an integer versus a um, a floating point, and that helped us debug the the custom app that we released. Um, and the the next one, yeah, you can go to the next uh, screen after that. One of the other features of um, the Google console was that um, it also allowed us to see the number of installs uh, that were being made and the number of uninstalls that were being made as well. Um, so now we could actually see, um, this is, it's not exactly like an MDM, but we can assess like how many of this, um, how many times that this app has been installed and how many times it's been uninstalled by accident, for example. Um, and so we can actually uh, track the, um, increase of app downloads over time. And same with the, the crash reports down there. Um, so this one has been, uh, has been useful uh, for us as well. Um, I think I, I added another image here earlier, but um, uh, no, it was in the, the previous one. I think you would need to uh, refresh on it. It's okay. Um, but you can also use um, uh, Google console analytics to track the number of um, which version of Android your devices are running on, right? Because maybe that there's a problem, not with the app itself, but you, some users are, um, are using a earlier version of Android that may have compatibility issues with uh, the Android app. And so that is a, a useful um, piece of information to know. Um, the problem with using the um, the Google Console, though, is that you need to have your own listing on the Google Play Store. And in order to do that, you need to um, sign the app yourself, you need to compile it yourself, and you probably need to have a developer who's familiar with um, the DHIS2 SDK in order to make your own listing. So um, the, the Android team at DHIS2 is working on solutions that you could actually get similar types of analytics that you would from Google Analytics, but in a, um, in a way that actually is hosted on your server and could compile those um, Android statistics um, and deliver them to a software called Matomo. So if you can go to the next slide, Anna. Um, so Matomo is also a, an open source uh, tool that would deliver you um, statistics on 
um, visits to your um, to your URL, um, how many of them were from Android devices, how many of them were from uh, the DHIS2 app, um, where were those visitors coming from, um, et cetera, um, the duration of visits, things like that. And so there's a lot of information that um, could be gleaned from these types of um, monitoring tools. Um, and I think that in the coming weeks, the DHIS2 team will be posting information about um, uh, integration with Matomo tools in the community of practice. So be on the lookout for some updates on uh, how to use Matomo for your Android implementation. Um, so this, um, speaking of like more in-depth, um, I, I saw some people mention um, earlier in the, in the um, Mentimeter about uh, server status um, and sort of performance of the server. Um, and so there are a number of different tools which we don't really have the, the time or scope of this, uh, this workshop to go into. But um, one of the, the favored ones that's been suggested, I, uh, I linked to it in the presentation to a community of practice link where it's discussed how you can use um, Prometheus um, to collect server statistics, and then Grafana, which is a, a visualization library to actually analyze your performance statistics. So you can see things here on you know, memory usage over time, uh, server requests. So um, one big piece of uh, you might notice is that you get a high number of server requests at the beginning of the day as people sort of log into their tracker for the first time or when they return from holiday, and then it sort of falls back over time. And so now you can actually um, uh, plan your server resources according to those um, thresholds of uh, maximal requests during the day, right? Um, so you can make sure that you have server capacity to meet that demand. Um, but um, there are more technical documents on how to do that, um, which I can send and link to. Uh, next, Anna. Um, and this was one of the, the last ones that um, I had in my list of tools, which is building your own custom app. And um, in our implementation in, in Bangladesh um, with ICDDRB, uh, one of the uh, analysts was, uh, was very gifted with, uh, with JavaScript and building his own custom apps. So he actually built a custom program monitoring app just specifically for our implementation with the, uh, the DHIS2 um, apps framework. So here is an example of how he has a listing by user, and then the number of uh, yes, say that, and then the number of um, monitor the number of um, MCH enrollments that were made for that user in the past 15 days, the number of MCH enrollments that were made in the last 30 days, total enrollments, and then the number of um, pregnancy identification stages that were actually made after the fact. And this is different from other DHIS2 analytics because you may have multiple users reporting to a single organization unit. And so you might want to actually drill down to the user level to see um, how are there any users which have been particularly inactive in the last 30 days. Maybe they're, they've, um, they've gone on leave um, or they've retired and then you can deactivate their accounts. But it's a way to drill down into the, the data. Um, and the um, and also it's filtering by uh, uh, a user group up there. So you can get a breakdown by user group. Uh, next. Um, and then here's another, um, in another tab uh, within this same app, he also built a platform to do um, a monitoring log of the call center. So it's a bit small and I apologize for that, but essentially this is a table of the, um, of the issues which have been reported from the field, and then um, who logged them, what the issue was, and then the status, whether this issue is still pending or it's been resolved. Um, so as an example, it might be that um, someone's device doesn't work, or they lost their password, or they've found a duplicate record. These reports can be from the, um, can be delivered from the field. Um, and so you might want to keep it in a log, whether that's in DHIS2 or it's an Excel spreadsheet 
where it's a Google Doc, whatever it happens to be, but you should keep a close eye of the, this log somewhere. And then at the end of the day, you can analyze and say, um, of the you know 100 issues that we've had, we've managed to resolve 85 of them. And that's a, a really strong performance for your, um, for your system. Um, that's all that I had, I think. Um, and now, um, if there are any questions about those tools before we go on to evaluation. I just have a quick question, Brian. How hard yeah. is that to actually use these tools out? I mean, if you just download the app, it's pretty self-sufficient. It's not very hard or... Yeah, so um, the, the first couple apps that um, I shared are DHIS2 apps that are found in the App Hub. So it's it's pretty straightforward to use the user of Zenit app or the usage analytics app. Um, you, could, you could go to, I'll send a link to the Play Store where you can explore a bit yourself and what it looks like. Um, but um, the other ones that get more advanced, you might need someone who has some experience with uh, SQL to, uh, to query the back end of the database. Um, and you may also have some, um, might want to have a developer on hand to use this um, Android monitoring or server monitoring tools as well. Martin, you have your hand up? Uh, yeah, there's a question here from the audience. Uh, is this the right slide? Evaluation, looking back yeah. to learning and improve? Yeah, yeah. I, I just progressed because I'm going to talk about that uh, in the next, yeah. Mm. Okay, yeah. So well, hopefully everyone sees that. Good. Yeah. So I think I'll, I'll, I'll uh, go through, I have another four slides in 10 minutes. Um, so uh, thank you so much, Brian. It was super useful. And you can reach out to Brian as well, brian at dhis2.org okay. uh, if you have specific uh, questions on his presentation or just post it in the, in the Slack. Thanks. So we've been talking uh, a lot on uh, monitoring up to now, but we also have uh, evaluation. And evaluation is, uh, as I said in the beginning, more um, concerned with assessing whether uh, things are progressing well, uh, whether you are achieving what you're set out to do, and if you're making the difference that you want to do. Uh, if it's happening, the evaluation would seek to understand how and why the intervention has worked well. If the project is unsuccessful, questions can be raised to what could have been done differently. So while monitoring is more just recording what is happening in an evaluation, you would put more judgment to it and, and, and try to understand why are we getting this result? Can we do something different the next time? And very high level, you could sort of think of evaluation to happen pre-project or more sort of readiness assessments. Are you ready to start? This is part of the part of this project planning template is part of this. Um, you can do evaluation work in the middle of your project. Should we change course? Are we going in the right, are we going in the right direction? Or end of the project, what should we uh, or others do differently next time? And you can approach evaluation in different ways. Um, I highlighted two of them here because I think this is what we do the most. Feasibility studies, uh, like are we ready to start? Is this even possible to do? Um, and we also do uh, quite a lot of this implementation research where we assess the uptake, the institutionalization, the sustainability of the system uh, in a given context, like are the policies, practices supporting your, uh, your project. But it, I, I would welcome, and I think many people would do that as well, welcome more sort of evaluation on health outcomes, whether the digital health intervention actually achieves the intended results, both in a controlled, more research type of setting, but also in a uncontrolled setting, in a non-research setting. So really looking into your service delivery indicators and for some projects, but then you would need maybe more sort of medical research uh, competence going in and seeing, well, are, if you have a health intervention, digital health intervention, where your aim is to make sure that um, babies are born, not premature, but later because you're doing something, then are you actually achieving this medical result? Does it help? But again, I think at least from, from the his perspective, the, these two types of, uh, of uh, evaluations here, the, the feasibility and the more research on the implementation itself is what we're doing 
more on. Um, yeah, and then uh, it's a key point that evaluation work should always result in some action points. Again, linking back to where did the evaluation results end up? Is it in a drawer or is it as in a report management? So uh, that an evaluation should result in action points. Uh, it could be to uh, organize your technical team differently, more devices, fix the design of the program, uh, increase awareness in the user community. I mean, it can the, the, the list can be long. I added here uh, one example of a type of uh, very sort of high level assessment work that we do quite a lot with the countries that we work with in the HISP network. Doing sort of um, uh, doing uh, looking at core areas for funding because quite often assessments are linked to future needs of funding, for example. So sometimes we do high level assessments uh, uh, in collaboration with or on behalf of, for example, Global Fund, uh, so that they also have more knowledge to whether approve uh, requests for funding for certain areas of the health information system. So this could be to then go in and via various methods, identify um, different challenges. You could identify that the, the, there is an understaffed national team. There, the team doesn't have sufficient skills in DHS to maintenance, for example, and then it ends up in some recommended targeted activities. So, and of course, again, then you can link it back to the funding, uh, the funding session that we had earlier or the budgeting where do you find budgets for this? What do you prioritize first? Yeah, there is a question here. Are there any specific conceptual frameworks for the implementation research option which are particularly suited for or designed for IT projects? Um, I can't sort of come up with anyone right now, but yes, there are different types of, um, what do you call it? Um, yeah, conceptual frameworks where you have a theory of change, for example, where you explain that you believe that these are the factors that impact um, that impact the progress or the successfulness of a, of a certain intervention, and then you try to monitor these things. I can try to dig up some and share share later. I think that was all I had. I had a short exercise in the end, but I don't think we have time for that. Um, any last final comments? I think my key takeaway is to remember that doing a little bit of monitoring and a little bit of evaluation is better than doing something, designing something super comprehensive that you're not actually going to do or look at. So if you take that with you out of the session, I will be happy.